right. Thank you for joining us today on Christ, Culture, and Coffee. I'm your host, Tyler Hurley, here with Robbie Lashua. Hey, what's up, guys? Good to be back, Tyler. Yeah, it's great to be back. Uh, we're super excited about the topic this week. We're going to be continuing on New Testament reliability by talking about variants in scripture that are important for us yeah. to address. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I've, I've been looking into these a lot, studying up on them a lot. It's kind of cool stuff. So it's going to be fun. Um, but before we get into that, Christ Culture and Coffee. So here is the coffee tip of the day. And Tyler, this is a little bit more like um, coffee trivia. All right. All right. So let's hear it. Here we go. The coffee tip is this. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like government and, you know, there's all these new rules and regulations and masks and this and that. And um, I was thinking about what governments can can make people do and how they can stop people and ban people from doing it. And I came across this piece of trivia about how coffee was banned in Mecca in 1511. Could you imagine that? Like, I think there'd be a revolt here. Like, it's over. No more coffee. We're banning it. That's it. Done. But they banned it because they thought that it would um, stimulate two things. Number one, radical thinking among people. And number two, congregating and hanging out. So the governor, wow. he thought, man, I don't want people to be able to hang out because then they'll get ideas and then they'll try to oppose me. And so he, he said, no more coffee. We're done with it. That's it. It's over. Wow. That's pretty tragic, honestly. It's, it that's is like, tragic, man. Yeah, that's like borderline persecution right there. Like, <laughs> it really <laughs> is. So I think they can have coffee in Mecca today, but that's how it was b- back in 1511. And so there you go. There's your coffee tip for today. Wow. Thank the Lord Jesus you do not live in Mecca in 1511, coffeeless. Wow. Yeah, that's that's absolutely crazy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, well, well, thanks for sharing that coffee tip with us today, Robbie. You're welcome. Uh, but now... Let's get into the topic for today. Yes. So again, we're going to be talking about variants in scripture, right? But these aren't just like the minor ones that we kind of talked about and touched on last week. Uh, These are the important variants that we need to be addressing as Christians, because these are kind of the ones that in a way, as you could say, almost have like a bite to them. Like there's a bit more of importance uh, a level of importance with these variants. Yeah, it's true. And we're going to get into, we're going to talk about three of them. And um, these three are very common passages in the Bible, and they probably shouldn't be in there. And then we're going to talk about one where we don't know if it should be there or shouldn't be, and the jury's out on it. And so what do we do with that doctrinally, and how does that affect our our walk with Jesus? Um, And so um, this might come as a little bit of a shock to people. I was was thinking about that all week. This might be a shock to you when you learn about these passages, but just know— um, nothing has changed other than you've learned something new and, right. um, and this, this has been the way it's been all along. Um, you just, or, or, or we, you know, we're just not up to speed on it. I actually had a lady email me a, a couple weeks ago and she was worried because of this type of stuff. And she said, people are trying to change right. the Bible. And I said, no, you don't understand. They're not trying to change the Bible. They're trying to correct bad transmissions of texts. <laughs> like it's a good right. thing that we know some of these passages shouldn't be in the Bible. So let's get started and talk about those. This will be fun. Yes, yes. And so the first one we want to talk about is the long ending of Mark. Yes. Now, uh, I'm not I'm not going to read through it, but I think most people have heard about this one. I think this is probably like one of the most common of these variants, uh, because if you go in your Bible right now to the last passage of Mark from verse nine until 20, I believe, yeah, nine through 20, uh, it has these brackets around it that will even say in your Bible that some of the earlier texts do not include this. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that we don't have the, believe that this is original is because these verses particularly are absent from two of the oldest Greek manuscripts. And those manuscripts are ones that we talked about last week too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Co- Codex Sinaiticus and Codex v- Vaticanus. Yep. And both are from the fourth century. Yeah, and these are right? important manuscripts, Tyler. I actually got to see Codex Sinaiticus when I was in, um, in England. They have it right, there. Right, yeah. It's awesome. But these are really significant because they're early, so they're fourth century, but also they're they're pretty much the complete New Testament in a book. And so yes. they're, they are like kind of the gold standard. These and a few others are like the gold standard of 
early Greek manuscripts. And so these are important, and the fact that this passage isn't in them speaks volumes. Right, and that's very important. So so noting that, and not only that, these are, like you said, they're from the 4th century, so mm-hmm. it's extremely early on that uh, of an uh, attestation where we don't have it. And mm-hmm. it, Whereas these manuscripts have been reliable on everything else that we have, so there's no reason to trust like that it should have been in there, you well, know? You, so you'd ask the question, why would they remove it? Like, how exactly. would you take out 12 verses? You know, that's crazy. It's a lot. Yeah. Yep. And so, so that's important to know. Uh, another reason that we don't, uh, believe that it's original is the early church fathers actually had no knowledge of its existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason we know that is because, uh, Clement of Alexandria and Origen, who are some of the early church fathers, uh, they did not acknowledge it in their writings. Yep. That, uh, when they were quoting scripture, it, they did not include it. And so that's yep. very important to note. Um, and not just them, but other church fathers attest to the shorter reading uh, where they actually include the Mark passage without those verses, uh, which is attesting for the fact that the shorter one ex- was the true manuscript, yep. not with the long ending. Yeah, and, yeah. that And that that's interesting, right? They, they kind of claim... The long ending is wrong. <laughs> like so, so yeah, it's exactly. not just they don't say anything. They say no, this isn't the right one. <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, Eusebius and Jerome, actually, two other church fathers, they attest that the passage, the long ending of Mark, was missing from almost every single Greek manuscript copy of Mark that they had known of. Yeah, so, so they're like, we this is yeah, it's hardly in any of them, right? Yeah, yeah. So so they're looking at this. And uh, so th- that's what's really interesting is you see early attestation of it not being in Scripture from the church fathers. That's a really big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah. And so uh, another th- um, reason that we don't think that it's original is scribes would uh, leave notes to us actually acknowledging that it was an addition, an early on manuscript. So like, like kind of like how we said that there were people would come in and put notes like on the mm-hmm. side margins or whatever. Uh, scribes would sometimes put notes when they were writing down and transmitting doctrine that where they in fact e- explain that it was a variant, uh, that it didn't have that in the original manuscript. Yeah. Uh, we even have a quote here from a scholar who said, not a few manuscripts that contain the passage have scribal notes stating that older Greek copies lack it. And in other witnesses, uh, the passage is marked with asterisk or a belly, which is the kind of sign that they would use on the top of it to confirm whether, like the meaning of the text. Mm-hmm. And so these conventional signs used by copyists to indicate spurious addition to a document, they weren't there. Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of basically what the quote is saying is that the earlier scribes were acknowledging like, yeah, this was not original. This wasn't here. Yeah. Yeah. And they're letting you know about it with the markings, which is interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so those are kind of like the, like external evidences, right? Like what we find in the manuscripts. Right. Now, if you look at the text and what it says, um, you, you find some discrepancies there as well. Uh, the vocabulary and the style of these 12 verses at the end of Mark are very, very different than the vocabulary and the style of the rest of the Book of Mark, which makes you I, go, wait a second, like he's, he's, he's talking different, he's talking weird, he's using different words. So for instance, a, a few examples of that are um, the word thanismon, which means deadly. So in verse 18, it talks about um, if you have faith, you can drink deadly poison and you won't die. Uh, that word deadly is not found anywhere else in the entire New Testament. So not only in the book of Mark, but nobody else uses that word in the entire New Testament, which makes us think maybe it's a word that was popular later or it just it seems very out of place. Right. Also, well, and I had heard of that, yeah. too. Yeah, because it, it's interesting, the word Thanisman, because that root term Thanis, uh, it, like you hear that in early Greek mythology. They use that name for uh, Thanatos, who was known as the god god of death. Mm-hmm. And so that, that root word meaning deadly, like that makes sense. Like why they would like you wouldn't find that being described anywhere with the, in the earlier passages, because you I know like through uh, Greek history, like that's mm-hmm. how the word is used. So that's very interesting. It's from the Greek God, right? Yeah, well, yeah, Tyler, exactly. what does it translate to in, in today's cinema? Yeah, well, exactly. Like, you know, the villain Thanos from the Avengers, like they called him that because it was from the word th- like Thanatos, like, the god mm-hmm. of death. So they're kind of using a play on words there and translating that into English, which I thought was pretty clever play on words. But yeah, yeah. that's uh, kind of like 
a little context of that word being used in the Greek. But That's really interesting. interesting, man. So what we're saying is that Thanos is trying to sneak into the ending of Mark, and we're oh, not having true. it. He doesn't belong yeah, there. Yeah. Get out. No, right? but he decided to snap his fingers and get rid of that big ending. Hey, so we're going to snap our fingers, and we're going to get rid of him. We're going to show that yeah, right. he doesn't belong in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's true, though. This word Thanos meant it doesn't exist anywhere else in the New Testament but in the long ending of Mark. Uh, in right. addition to that, there's also this phrase in um, verse 10 of Mark 16, which says, those who had been with him, and it's talking about the disciples. This phrase uh, isn't found anywhere in the New Testament either. And so if it was yeah. a common phrase used for the disciples, uh, you'd expect to, to find it other places, but it's not. So that's interesting. Um, and then also there's other words, Greek words, that aren't found anywhere else in the book of Mark except in this long ending. And they're the Greek words for uh, the word confirmed in verse 20, the word hurt in verse 18, the word disbelieved in verse 16, the word followed in verse 20, the word seen in verse 14, the word go in verse 15, the word worked with in verse 20, and the word afterward in verse 14. Those words are not found anywhere else in the book of Mark. So you look at it and you go, this seems out of place. This doesn't seem like Mark actually wrote that. Also, um, verses 8 to 9. So, so we believe that the text ends in verse 8. In between verse 8 and 9, it's a really like disjointed, choppy transition. Like there is no transition. They don't flow smoothly at all. Um, in verse 8, it says, They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So it's talking about the women. They, they went away from the tomb, astonished, and they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. Then verse 9, which is the beginning of this long variant, says, now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. So first of all, it switches the subject of talking about the women to talking about Jesus, like really abruptly. It doesn't flow at all. It doesn't seem like Mark actually wrote that. And also, um, verse 9 introduces Mary Magdalene to us, like we don't know who she is, right? right. Like, hey, yeah. what's that lady who seven demons have come out of? But... The problem with that is in verse 16, 1, it talks about Mary Magdalene. In verse 15, 47, it talks to, about her. So where is this idea like, oh, you've lost track of who she is, you know, in the last eight <laughs> verses? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense, man. It seems very disjointed, out of place, not the same vocabulary, all of those things. So for all of these reasons we just listed, Tyler— we think that these 12 verses are not original, and that's why, like you mentioned, if you look in your Bible, they'll be in brackets. They'll probably be a footnote saying these aren't in the earliest manuscripts because we know they're not original. Now, right. I'm thankful that these verses aren't original because they're pretty weird. Right. right. When yeah, you read okay. into them, you get stuff like, let me just read a little portion here. This is really interesting. Um, verses uh, 17 and 18. These are words of Jesus in this edition. Uh, supposedly, Jesus said, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover picking up snakes tyler yeah that's a bit that's a bit strange there you know there are churches in the appalachian mountains snake handling churches and they actually pick up poisonous snakes because yes. they think that if they have come in jesus name that they won't be hurt and actually a couple people have died doing it yeah no it's true it happens and they say that like what well, like it's really interesting because you would think like when you're reading that, it, it would have to be taken in the literal sense for how it's written. Yeah. But clearly that's not in reality. No, and, and drink so, poison? You can drink poison and you won't be hurt? Yeah. That's that's, not, is that true? No, no. I mean, so, no, again, so I don't think that this is scripture. I don't think it's original and I'm okay with that because it's unless really you, strange. Yeah, unless you take the the, the bad 
interpretation of the passage saying, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens and, strengthens. And <laughs> yes, you like, apply that. Even yeah, handle snakes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, man. that's like a force. If you take the, if you hold the misinterpretation of that and you believe yeah. that, that that's included, then sure, there you go. Let's not do that. But okay. No, let's not. No. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm okay with it being gone and we don't really miss much if it's not if it's not scripture, if it's not original. Right, so. right. And so yeah, yeah. And so it makes sense why we don't like include that and that why that's not original. Mm-hmm. And with that, we also have uh, another passage I was going to share with you here. Uh, this is the Trinitarian edition in First John 5, 7 through 8. Yeah. Now, so, I, I, sorry? Yeah, so we got a couple of passages here we want to read because the King James Version has the edition in it, but most other versions yes. don't. So we want to read... A different version so you can hear what's supposed to be, and then we'll read the King James Version with this added text in it. Yes, yes. So I'm going to read the NASB version first real fast. And so this is uh, without the text added in. So it says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Okay? Okay. Pretty simple. So so that's uh, 1 John 5, 7 through 8 in Mm -hmm. NASB. Now, in the KJV, the same passage reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Yeah. Now, do you see how (laughs) drastically different that that is there? Yeah, it, it literally adds the words, in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth. That's, yeah. that's the variant. That's the additional text that's thrown into the middle of those verses. Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's very interesting because uh, – so there are some reasons though that we have to back up why this isn't original. Yeah. And one of those reasons to start off with is that the this edition, like the others, are absent from all Greek manuscripts except for eight. And again, I say that that's all except for eight. And how many do we we have? Like what five thousand three hundred Greek manuscripts, and it's not in. Yeah, it's it's absent from all of them except for not in. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not in thousands of them. It's absent from, and so uh, the I'm going to list because obviously it's a lot easier to say which ones it has it in since there's not as many. Yeah. Uh, So I'm going to list the eight manuscripts or like some of the dates of them. So we have. The eight manuscripts that we have here in the Trinitarian edition are dated to the 16th century uh, for five of them, and then one of them in the 10th century, and then one in the 14th century, and then another in the 18th. So the earliest is the 10th. Yes, and that's only one that we have. Okay. So that's the earliest, and we only have one that takes place in the 10th century, which is very late compared to all of our other manuscripts. Yeah, it seems like it got added way later. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And so four of the eight manuscripts that have it have it as a variant reading in the margins, uh, which, like we said earlier, when the scribes would write things in the side, that indicates that it's not original. But wait a second. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So there's only eight that have it, but half of those have it and they're saying it's not original. Yeah. Well, they have it uh, in the margins. They have it saying in the in the margins that this is a variant reading, this is not Indicating original. Indicating it's not half. original. So wouldn't you say that only four of them attest to it as a real reading and then four yeah. are attesting against it? <laughs> right? I mean, that's well, funny. Well, and in a way, too, 5,000 are attesting against it, too, by not including it. Well, yeah, and so, I was just – I was thinking about that because we have to be – again, I'm, I'm reading this book on being accurate with these numbers. Oh, right, yeah. And so we do have 5,300 Greek New Testament manuscripts, but they're not all this passage. Oh, well, yeah, of course. So we would have to look at how many Mark passages we have that are missing it and how many we have that are are making it. But I'm pretty sure we have more than eight Mark passages. Oh, of course. You know, so. Of course. No, thank you for clarifying that. Well, I was just, I said it too, and then I was thinking about it, and I was like, wait, we got to be clear with that. Yeah. No, that, of course, yeah, we need to be accurate because that is specific. We don't obviously have 5,000 manuscripts specifically of this passage the end of mark yeah sure yeah yeah so so that that's what we need to be aware of is how we're doing uh 
this text criticism. But still, those manuscripts are so late. It doesn't seem like... Oh, they are. Like, they are. So, so it got and added it, way later. So that, that's really yeah, interesting. There's just not enough compelling evidence, I think, uh, yeah. and so do most scholars, that it should be included. Okay. Uh, so another reason that this uh, that we don't think this passage is original is because it was not quoted by any of the early church fathers. That's a and big so, deal. It is a big deal. And so they definitely would have used this uh, when they were com uh, kind of combating the heretical doctrines of Arianism through the Council of Nicaea yeah. in 325, where they rejected the belief that Jesus was a created being and not the eternal God. So yeah. in, in this passage talks about that, right? Yeah. But like, again, yeah. Well, and we have like all these writings of like, um, like, because Arian and Athanasius were going back and forth at each other all the time in writings about, no, Jesus is God. No, he's not God. Yeah, Athanasius yeah. would have totally used those verses if he could have. Yeah, yeah. And so, and this mm. passage is like on top of that too. It's not found in any of the early versions or translations of the New Testament from uh, any of them, except okay. for I think it's uh, uh, it being in some some of the later Latin translations. Which again, yeah. like we said of that, it's there's only eight, and yeah. half of them attest in the margins that it's a variant. So yeah, well, I think those I eight though. Know, I think those eight are the Greek manuscripts, right? Oh, correct, correct. So and then the, there's yeah. only, but then, but then with the translations, there's only a couple or a few in later Latin. So like, yes. there's hardly any man. I really exactly. think that point you made, dude. That whole council and I see a thing's interesting because the whole thing was about Jesus deity. And if they would have had that verse, dude, they would have plastered that on the walls. Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, like it would have been all over the, the place. The fact that they don't use it, it's not in the early, it's not in Greek, hardly any Greek manuscripts. It's not in. Hardly any, I mean, really hardly any of the earliest translations. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And so it's important to note that when we're uh, looking at the text that, um, th in my opinion, there are just so many reasons why it should not be included. And so and, yeah. and for one, I for one think it's strange how it even ended up in the New King James. Yeah, but. no, that is interesting. That That's a whole, I was, I was reading up on this and that's a whole book in and of itself. How did oh, it right. sneak its way in and what what manuscripts were they using um, and, and how they translated it. So yeah, that is, that's interesting. Um, right. a, another thing I saw about this that, that makes us think it's not original was that the earliest instance of this passage being quoted as part of the actual text doesn't come until the fourth century. And it's in this Latin letter, uh, and it's called, uh, Liber Apologeticus. And it was written by either, there's two options. It was written by this Spanish heretic named Priscillian, uh, and he died around 385. Or it was written by this this heretic, Priscillian's follower, um, Bishop Instantius. So the first time we have it is by a heretic, follower of a heretic, in the, in the late 4th century. Yeah. So that's interesting. It's not even mentioned until then. Um, I thought that was... Uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And so the question becomes, how did this sneak its way in? And there's some speculation on this, but there, there's a lot of agreement on this speculation, which I think is really fascinating. Uh, a lot of textual critics think that this variant was made because um, when scribes read that there are three, the spirit, the water, and the blood, they thought it should be understood as a symbol for the Trinity. And so right. it's possible that somebody wrote that in the margins, like, oh, this is probably talking about the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then eventually that made its way and sneaked its way into the text. Because we've seen that happening when they write in the margins, then eventually it makes its way into the text. And so that's kind of the speculation on how did this get in there. Um, so with all of that in mind, um, we, we have to understand that this original Trinitarian formula is not original. Um, now, think about this. If it was original, there is no way anybody would ever remove it from the text, right? We have to think about oh, yeah. what, what, which, which reading would lend itself to the other. 
The fact that it got added later because people wanted to clarify the doctrine of the Trinity makes sense. The idea that it was original and then somebody removed it from most of the documents and most of the translations and all of the church father's writings, that makes zero sense. There's no way they would have removed it. They totally would have used it all over the place, especially with the controversy about Jesus' deity. So again, we don't think that this this passage in 1 John 5 is original. It should be taken out and it will be in brackets and there will be a footnote in your Bible about it. Right. Yeah. And that, that that's important to note. So, yep, it is. Um, so let's go on to the third one that shouldn't be in your Bible. Now, Tyler, I want to preface it with this. Those first two, it's like, to me personally, I'm like, whatever. Right. This third one hurts a little bit. Yes. <laughs> I like no, this one. I, I, I want it too. to be real. Yeah. This is one that, that it, it sounds like something that Jesus would have actually said. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and this is the passage of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter seven. Yep. Right. And so uh, I'm going to read it, read through it really quick. Just yeah, passage, definitely. Yep. It's, it's pretty short. So uh, again, this is uh, from John chapter seven, verses 53 through chapter eight, 11. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. It, he came into the temple and all the people coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, in the law of Moses, uh, commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Then they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, uh, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Right? Yep, there it is. And it's now, beautiful, man. I love that story. I love it. It's it's awesome. Yeah, of course. And, and now the reason why people love this passage, and I do too, because the thing is you read this and it doesn't seem like something out of character for Jesus to say, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like when you're looking at this, he's saying, yeah, like, like he, he who's without sin cast the first stone. And that provides like a biblical message that's throughout the entire uh, new Testament that Jesus yep. teaches is, is that, that we're all guilty of sin, right? Yeah. So you think like, yeah, okay, this would be believable for something Jesus said. However, there are evidences that it is not original. Yep. A lot so, of evidences. Yes, a lot of evidences, and we again, like we like we said, we need to be accurate with where where the evidence leads us, and it, mm-hmm. uh, our personal biases on whether or not we think it's a good story should not influence whether or not we put it in the canon of scripture. That's right, but I uh, want to go on record. I think it's a great story, and I think it yeah, preaches right. so good, man. You can preach this, you can get down, you can start yes. pretending to draw on the ground. Oh man, it's it's <laughs> such a beautiful passage. It rips my heart out to think it's probably not original. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. And that's okay. So uh, what it says here is uh, from external evidence that we have, it was really interesting is that it's missing from a bunch of early Greek manuscripts, such as the Bodmer Papyrus II uh, and then Codex Sinaiticus, which mm-hmm. again, like we said earlier, we've been mentioning that a lot. It's a big big deal. evidence. Yep. Piece, right. And then the Codex Venaticus and uh, that, and then at least 24 more. And so what's crazy about that is there's all these really reliable Greek manuscripts that we have that don't include it. And again, this yep. is all external evidence. Yeah. That, but, but yeah, why isn't it there in the earliest yeah. and the best attested? Why isn't it there? Exactly. And then on top of that, no Greek church fathers prior to the 12th century mention these verses. That's uh, okay. And, and, Pl- prior to the 12th century? Yeah. Bro, that's, that's insane. Very so late. like yeah, like why like this is like I was saying, I love preaching this passage. It's such a good passage to preach. But none of the early church fathers for twelve hundred years yeah, mention it. Right. What is going on? Well, right. they probably didn't have it, right? It probably wasn't there in John. Yeah, and then the first guys to comment on uh this state that the accurate copies 
of the Gospel of John do not have these verses in them. So like the earliest record that we have of people talking about or acknowledging this passage, uh, like th they're saying, oh yeah, this is not accurate. Like this, <laughs> this is a variant. So the first yeah. mention of it discredits it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the first mention yeah. says, no, it's not original. <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, it's unfortunate, but yeah, uh, that's, and then Robbie, if you want to break down, what are some internal evidences too, that we have yeah, on so this path? If you, and again, I love this story, but if you, if you look at the passage and you take it out, cause that's the question is, okay, what if we remove these verses from, from chapter seven, verse 52 through eight, uh, or seven fifty three through eight eleven. Um, right. so you'd be left with seven fifty two. And, and verse 8, 12, and they would need to go together, right? So do right. they fit together well if we remove this story? And actually they do. And so I want to read a little bit yeah. of the end of chapter 7 and then uh, chapter 8, verse 12. So <clears throat> Jesus, the story in, in 7 is Jesus is being accused of all these things by Pharisees, and then there is the crowd kind of coming to his uh, defense, um, so I'm going to pick it up there. So in, in John 7, verses 49 through 52, it says this. But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed, the Pharisees are saying. Nicodemus, he who came to him uh, before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? Okay, so think about this. There, th The Pharisees are just cursing people and Nicodemus says whoa, whoa whoa guys we got to hear this guy out we're not going to just we're not going to just accuse somebody or judge somebody before we hear their story so he's saying we should listen to what Jesus has to say right verse 52 they answered him you are not also from Galilee are you search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee so they're making fun of Nicodemus okay now, that's where the adultery story gets just thrown in. And then they brought a woman, caught in adultery, boom, right? Well, let's say that that's not original because we don't think it is. How would the story flow? So Nicodemus says, hey, we should hear this guy out. They make fun of Nicodemus. And then if you go to chapter 8, verse 12, this is what it says. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So he does the very thing Nicodemus said that he should do. Hey, we should let him talk. You know, we should hear him out. Then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And they say, your testimony is not true. It flows, man. Like it, it fits together if we remove the woman caught in adultery passage. Does that make some sense? Right. It's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. And so, so like, that's an internal evidence that we have there. Um, also, in yeah. many of the manuscripts that have this passage, once again, they mark it with an asterisk to show that it's not right. original. So again, we have we have not just absence of it, but we also have people telling us it's not original. Uh, so the question becomes, where do we get this story? Like, how did it just get thrown yeah, right. in there? Right? It's kind of weird. Um, a lot of people believe that this story might have some historical merit to it because like you said, Tyler, it sounds like something Jesus would do, right? It, it makes sense if this yeah. is what he, something he said or did. So a lot of people yeah, believe of that. Yeah. But they think it might be like a piece of oral tradition that had been circulating that people knew it's possible that Jesus actually did this. And this was circulating and people knew the story, right? Or maybe even it got written down and it was like a side story. Um, you kind of know like those like those uh, side Star Wars stories like Solo, Rogue One. It's kind of like that, right? Yeah, <laughs> It's right. not the main story. There you go. But it's like – so it might have gotten written down and they might have had it circulating. And we, we do know this for sure that there were a lot of scribes who wanted to put it into the Gospels. And we know that because a lot of them put it after uh, chapter 7, verse 52 of the Gospel of John. But we have other manuscripts where scribes put this story in, uh, in uh, after John chapter 7, verse 36. Some put it in John after John 7, 44. Others put it in John uh, after 21, 25. 
Right. And then the crazy thing is some one manuscript actually has it in Luke after Luke chapter yeah. 21, verse 38. So they like this story and they wanted to get it in there, but they didn't know where it fit. Right. So it's just it's fascinating to, to look into this textual criticism stuff, especially with these three passages that are the big three that that we kind of uh, should remove or, or, or not take as original. Yeah, and I think I think personally with it, the message that's behind it and mm -hmm. the story being in there, uh, I think it's great. But um, I, I think it's good that we do have brackets around there in every Bible saying like, hey, this is not an original text because we, we yeah. need to be acknowledging uh, what's not original. So that's very important. It is. And, and pra so practically, right, because I'm a pastor at a church. And mm -hmm. so if I if I'm teaching through the book of Mark, I will not teach the last 12 verses. Yeah, right? you shouldn't. It ends at 16.8. If I'm teaching through 1 John, I will not teach the Trinitarian concept. And I don't have to because I use the NASB. So it's not even in my version, which is great. Right. If I'm preaching through John, this is where it gets tough. Like, I'll skip this passage. But man, I like it. You know, th th yeah. this is the one that pulls on my heartstrings. It's hard. But I think that that's kind of the responsible thing to do to say... And I've, I've seen guys do it where they'll preach it and they'll say, listen, this isn't in the earliest manuscripts. It's definitely not original to John, but I do think it's a historical story about Jesus that actually happened. So we're going to well, talk about there's it. There's some evidence that leads to that as a possibility, sure. of course. Sure. Uh, but, but we don't have get concrete. Into, but you get into just because Jesus did something that a story was written down by, is that inspired scripture? Um, and no, I don't uh, think that. it gets weird, man. So I would, if I was preaching through the book of John, and I came to this passage, I'd just skip it. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, but I would. So, so yeah. So with that though, these are the big three, yeah. right? When it comes to variant readings that we know aren't original and they shouldn't be read as original, yeah. as we said. Uh, however, there are others that text critics have not concluded one way or another. And we kind of want to take a look at those next and go through some of the tougher variants where yeah, it's like, we, okay. Th and this is where it gets tough, man, because like, so remember last week we said 99% of the original autographs we know. Yes. And then there's text variants where we don't know. Right? This, this is one of those. We don't know how to we don't know how to decipher this. Like we don't know which way to go on it. And so yeah. it's kind of it, this is a tough one, all right? So we want to we really want to kind of give people a look at what does it look like when text critics are trying to do their job and they go they, they go through all the criteria, they get to the end and go, we don't know which reading's original. So we want to do that, which this is kind of fun. Yeah, of course. And so uh, absolutely, Robbie. And so uh, w one of the tough variants that we want to touch on is uh, from the beginning of Mark. This is uh, Mark chapter one, verse one, first verse in Mark. And think about yeah. this, it's probably the first verse of the gospels written, right? Because Mark was written yeah, first. So man, is. you're telling me right off the bat, there's a significant variant in the very first verse of the very first gospel, Tyler? Come on. Yes. And I'm <laughs> going to explain it right now. All right. Yeah. So here we go. But the, again, again, we'll explain and we'll break down what this means for us. But yeah. here's, here's what the passage says. It says in Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Mm. That's all it says. Doesn't sound super controversial at first, right? Doesn't. No, it doesn't. Right. However, the part, portion where it says at the end, the son of God is the important text variant in this verse. OK. Reasons for it not being original. Okay. Now, that may intimidate you at first, because, uh, but there are reasons why it is not originally there where it says the son of God. Okay. Uh, the variant is not in some very important manuscripts, including, again, Codex Sinaiticus. It's huge. Uh, Yep, which we keep bringing up, and then Codex uh, Corydentheus. Mm -hmm. And so these are very important because in Sinaiticus, the first written uh, text of this verse has the variant missing. However, the longer reading with the variant is found in it too, which was a correction that was made by one of the original scribes. So that just makes it more confusing. So it's it's yeah. not in the 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 first dude who who's who's handwriting Sinaiticus. It's not there. But then one of the right. original scribes is like, "Oh, we forgot this," and he adds it. So which is it? Yeah, yeah, right. And that's that's <laughs> what's interesting about this. And uh, what's what's interesting is Origen. Uh, again, we mentioned him earlier. He's a second to third century church father. He quotes Mark one one many times. 
However, he doesn't include the phrase son of God in that passage, meaning okay. it's more evidence that it's a variant. Mm. Our earliest evidence of Mark 1.1 1, 1 in, in it comes from the late 3rd or 4th century. Okay. Uh, it is on an amulet in which there was a strip of material with a verse on it, which was rolled up and worn around a person's neck. Uh, that was kind of like a way that they carried it on them. And this amulet does not contain the phrase son of God. And that was discovered being dated from sometime the late third or fourth century. So that's okay, like, so the, really, okay, wow. And that's the earliest, that's the earliest yes. recording of Mark one, one. It doesn't have it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. really important to note. So again, the earliest rating, uh, um, recording that we have of this passage from the third or fourth century, which that's, that's really early. And we don't, it doesn't have the, phrase son of God in that passage. Okay. So you're saying reasons for it not being original. It's not in the first writing of Sinaiticus. It's not in some other important Greek manuscripts. Origen quotes this verse and he never uses the phrase son of God. And in the very earliest um, evidence of Mark 1, 1 in this amulet, in this necklace, the phrase son of God is not used there either. No. Nope. Okay, so those are reasons against it. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate and I'm going to say, okay, Tyler, well, here's the reasons for why it should be in. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's okay. This variant, the son of God is in some important manuscripts, including Codex Vaticanus and Codex Washingtonian, Washingtonianus, which is at the Smithsonian, I think, uh, which makes sense because Washington. So it's in some important and it's in some others, but the the main one's Vaticanus. So it's not in Sinaiticus, like you said, but it is in Vaticanus, and they're both from the fourth century. Right. There so we go. which way do we go on it, man? Now I know Origen doesn't use it when he quotes Mark one one, but Irenaeus, who was a second century church father, he quotes Mark one one a whole bunch, and he uses the Son of God in his quotations. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It is. So. so uh, there's a lot of conflicting data here. Yeah, man. So which way do you go, right? <laughs> now, the other thing that I think is interesting is that most of the Greek manuscripts that we have, as well as most of the different translations, have the Son of God variant in them. Okay. So that's a big deal. So most of them have it. Um, so you gave why not? Some don't contain it. Some church fathers don't quote it. The earliest copy we have of it doesn't have it. I gave some really important manuscripts have it. Most manuscripts have it. And an early church father does quote it. So here we go. How do textual critics decide <laughs> which one's original? When you get all the data laid out and you're trying to compare, ah. what do we do here? How do we go? So what they do, what we did with the earlier ones, is we have to think through which reading would give rise to the other reading, right? Let's pretend yes. this one's first, and how would this one come about? Let's pretend this one's first and pretend and, and figure out how this one would come right. about. That's what we have right. to do with this verse, with this variant. Yeah, and then the other thing is, would scribes intentionally remove these words? That's another question you have to consider. Yeah, that, so that's uh, that's where we'll say, okay, so yeah. if we're going to weigh them, right, we'll say, okay, let's say it is there, and then somebody would have to remove it. So would scribes remove them? Yeah, and I think the answer is most likely they wouldn't remove it. Yeah, uh, no because, way. Yeah, because because of what it says specifically, Son of God, right? Like you want that to be in there. You yeah, want that's, that. To be yeah, that's something you definitely would want there. You wouldn't. Yeah, remove, yeah. Ah, that's and, lame. Uh, Let's scratch that out. No way. Yeah. So it's most likely that they didn't remove it. They like we said, we they wouldn't want to remove it if it was. Yeah. And, uh, but could they have le accidentally left them out in other mm. manuscripts? That's possible. I mean, it's yeah. it's it, it's happened before with some variants but but this is like this is something that's like a big deal because of how much conflicting information or i should say how little evidence yeah. on both sides that we have supporting it either way and so yeah so i it, don't think scribes would like you said they wouldn't intentionally remove it but they could have accidentally yeah. made a mistake right right yeah and it's um possible. Yeah, last week we talked about like, you know, we, we see mistakes scribes make and they've categorized these mistakes because there's common mistakes they make when they're copying the text by hand. And one of those mistakes that we talked about is um, categorized and it's called homoi ote luton. Homoi ote luton. Home oite luton. It's six syllables. And that six it, times fast. Yeah, it's so hard to say. <laughs> but it means a like ending, right? And so they would leave words out 
and it would be caused because there were other words that looked similar to the ending of those words, so they already thought they wrote it because they were just glancing at the end of those words. So this is where it gets weird with this passage. Um, there's this thing called uh, nomina sacra, and it's Latin for the sacred name. So it stands for um, kind of like an abbreviated shorthand for writing uh, several divine names or titles. So like Jesus, Christ, Son of God, God, Lord. They had like, instead of writing those words completely out, they would write the Greek capital letters of typically the beginning of the word and the end of the word or the next word. Um, right. And then they draw a line across the top of it, connecting it, showing you that it's nomina sacra. Then you could look at the abbreviation and you'd know if it's Father, if it's Jesus, if it's God, if it's Jesus Christ, if it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all of those kinds of things. So that's nomina sacra. Now, the phrase Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as nomina sacra, so with the abbreviations, it would be these capital Greek letters in a row with a line above them. The letters would be iota, upsilon, chi, upsilon, 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 theta, upsilon. So that's a lot of upsilons. It looks like an upsilon looks like a Y, a capital one looks like a Y to us. So this, this phrase, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the abbreviated nomina sacra, looks like a capital I, a capital Y, capital X, capital Y, capital Y, capital Y, capital O, capital Y. Yeah. So this is a problem. It would be very easy to leave off the theta epsilon, which is Son of God, because you look down and you've already written three Ys in a row. Right, your eyes can yeah. just play a trick on you. So it's not a crazy idea that this could accidentally get left out. However, Tyler, right. there's a problem with this. Th then the other side argues, well, this is the very first verse of the book, right? Yeah. Well, what does that That's mean? Well, the scribe's probably pretty alert and fresh when he's just starting to copy stuff. <laughs> like, are you yeah. kidding me? Like, your eyes are already playing tricks on you? That would be terrible. You just started, man. Maybe you should look for a new line of work, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so they say that doesn't, that's stupid. He, they wouldn't make a mistake this early on. Now, the other side comes back and says, oh, really? Because we have examples of scribes making this exact mistake in Mark 1.1 in later manuscripts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have a guy who actually leaves it out and then later goes in and puts it in because he realized his mistake. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's so important to know. Like, And that's that's kind of where this is coming down to is, is was this a scribe mistake? Uh, yeah, that's kind of was, like, it, was it an accident? And dude, so there's arguments on both sides of where you can say, oh, I could see it be a mistake. And then you're like, I don't know. Like there's arguments against it being a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the other question you have to ask is would scribes add these words to the text? And now, now it's possible because yeah. of their refer reverence for Jesus that scribes would want to add these words. Like they want to... The, the whole passage of Mark like says like, Hey, he's the son of God. So it yeah. makes sense that they would want to add that in the beginning. Yep. Uh, plus they might know Mark's gospel well enough to know like, Hey, he says this repeatedly. So of course that's a yeah. part of the message. Yeah. He calls Jesus uh, the son of God well, all over the, the place. Question, but like, yeah, exactly. So, and so, so the question, so let's just recap real quick. So right. The, the textual, criticism data is hard to figure out when we look at all the manuscripts and stuff and who quotes it and who doesn't quote it. Then you get into, okay, which one would give rise to the other? Would scribes just remove it intentionally? No way. Would they accidentally leave it out? There's arguments yes, there's arguments no. Uh, would they add these words? Yes and no. Right. So you go, th you synthesize all this stuff and you go through these arguments and thought um, um, exercises and you, you come out and you go, I don't know. And this is this is one of them where scholars haven't concluded one way or the other on is this in there or is it not in there? This is one of the one percent where we don't know what the original reading was. Right, right. And so uh, like that's the thing is uh – too is well like the big question about this is what does it change doctrinally if we take this out right mm -hmm. that's the main question and that's so, a big deal uh, yeah and so it, it definitely would change somewhat how we interpret the verse in itself yeah uh, by jesus being called the son of god but 
Jesus is called the Son of God in Mark throughout all sorts of other places. Like we see this still in the same chapter in uh, 111, mm-hmm. uh, in 311, in 57, 97, 1461, 1539. And so, so we don't lose the doctrine in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. But it does change how we would interpret that verse. So, so that's where. Uh, we have to understand like, yeah, it's important, obviously, if it says that Jesus is the son of God or not. And that's actually what it meant in verse one. Uh But it doesn't take away the doctrine that the whole gospel of Mark is arguing that Jesus is the son of God. Absolutely, man. And and um, even like in 14, when they say, are you the son of the blessed one? He says, I am. And I I mean, it's just so clear. Yeah, yeah, and then like, the centurion like the calls him the name. He calls him the son of God, and yeah. So we don't lose the doctrine. But one one point of clarification with all this is a lot of times you'll hear people say textual variants don't affect doctrine at all. And if by that we mean we don't lose the doctrine, even if we lose one verse, yes, that's true. But to say it doesn't affect doctrine at all, well, it does affect the doctrine of that one verse, like you said. So again, just for transparency, we want to be very clear when we're talking about variants yes. and not just you know cast them all off as, well, there's only 1% and it doesn't change anything. Well, it does change verses. But yeah. like you said, it doesn't change the belief of Christianity, the major doctrines. We don't lose a doctrine because no doctrines are based on just one verse. Right? right? We have multiple right. verses that are talking about all of these things. So now, Tyler, let me just ask you a fun question. With this Mark 1.1, 1, 1, which way do you lean? Which one do you think it is? Because the scholars don't know. What, what do you think? My, my interpretation of what I personally think is that it's not original, but okay. someone included it in there somewhere at some point. And so uh, scholars and scribes stuck to it because it, it – it supports the argument of what the rest of the book says. That's okay. what my opinion is. That, that's what I think by yeah. looking at it. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Robbie? Eh, I mean, I kind of lean towards it's original. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. like, I, Cause I, I, I look at it like, and, and it again, like I see both sides of it. I'm not like, I'm not sure at all, but I can see the point that it would be original cause it's in the majority of Greek manuscripts. Right. And versions. And so it's like, okay, how did it get in the majority? And then with Origen not quoting it, but he was like third, fourth century, or Irenaeus does quote it, he's second century. Those are reasons. But I, I could see I could it makes sense to me too, like what you're saying, like a scribe would add this yeah, because yeah. they wanted to bolster Jesus credentials right off the bat. It makes sense too. Yeah, and well I would even go as far as to say too, is that like e- even if it turns out like that I mean uh, if we, there was enough evidence to support the argument that it shouldn't be included, then of yeah. course I think we should pull it out. Mm-hmm. But in the current state that we're in right now with not fully knowing, yeah. I, I think it's best to just keep it. Yeah. I, I, I personally do because I, I think it it actually supports uh, like the rest of the book. It, I don't think it really – it changes the context of the verse like we said, but it doesn't change the concept – of the in context of the of the book of Mark entirely. So yeah, exactly. I, yeah. So I, either way, I think that it should be left in there, but that's whether or not it's accurate. So <laughs> yeah. Well, and see, and this is this is fun, man. I love doing this kind yeah. of stuff and really digging deep into this and thinking through it. And for our listeners out there, again, we want you to know we can for sure say we know ninety nine percent of what the original said for sure. No questions yes. asked. When we come to this verse in Mark 1, 1, we don't know. It does not affect our belief. It doesn't make us lose the doctrine that Jesus is the Son of God, but it would change what this verse says. And so we just want to make sure you're clear on that. But this shouldn't be a crisis of faith. This should actually bolster your faith because we can be confident. with We know what the New Testament actually said in the original yes. manuscripts. So, hey, make sure, too, if you're not following us on YouTube, we'd love for you to follow us on there and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us out to get mo- more notoriety. And if you yeah. would also, check us out on social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram and everything. We're not on TikTok, Tyler. <laughs> right. That's, and I don't that's think, I don't thing. know if we're going to get on that. Well, um, but we're at yeah, Facebook, yeah. everywhere else. So we'd love to well, connect sure with you, you and talk definitely, with you. Yeah. Make sure you definitely join us on our social media platforms too, because you can go ahead and reach out to us um, on Twitter now. That's newer for mm-hmm. us. Uh, you can send us a tweet, a direct message, or an Instagram message. If you have any questions about the material that we discussed in this podcast, yeah. We're in this series because uh, we've we've covered so much, and I'm sure 
uh, that's possible that a lot of you might have some questions. So feel free to reach out. We'd love to get back to you. Uh, if there's anything that you need some more clarity on that we described mm -hmm. in the content here, uh, but be sure to follow us on all our platforms so you can be up to date with what we're doing. So thank you so much for being with us today on Christ Culture and Coffee. We look forward to seeing you guys next week.